So, for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference first occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as the, uh, as the Guardian put it, it's actually aim hidden behind the brush deal, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets, and the techno parties, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and to begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. I've been giving a lot of thought lately about the types of audiences who turn up to events like this. What sort of people, or what sorts of people are interested in virtual futures? And the more I think about it, the more I keep coming back to this singular idea, this idea of escapism. Escapism from an increasingly perplexing present, one that we feel, so fundam uh, one that we feel is so fundamentally flawed that we can't help but fantasize about the alternative. The problem is that since the turn of the 21st century, humanity's self-esteem is at its all-time low. And these fantasies very quickly uh, turn almost uh, masochistic. So let me explain what I mean by that. Firstly, what do I mean by virtual when I talk about virtual Futures. Well, it's nothing to do with virtual reality, so sorry to the people who turned up for that sort of talk. I mean virtual in the Deleuzian sense, in the sense of the virtual, a kind of potentiality that becomes fulfilled uh, in the actual. The virtual is not material, but it is real. It's an abstract possible, something that can be imagined but hasn't yet come to pass. Virtual futures matter because when a successful idea has enough libidinal power injected into it, it is able to enter the arena of culture where it becomes a hyperstition, a hyper-superstition. These hyperstitions are more powerful than memes and have the ability to influence the entirety of our collective cultural evolution. The best example of something that we have conjured into being is probably capitalism, which now that it has been downloaded into our culture has casually brought about its own reality. In fact, this reality has become, be, become so baked in by the positive feedback cycles that it has now, in the words of Frederick Jameson, become easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. As such, we are now really good at imagining the end of the world. Maybe it's going to be AI that's going to stray, uh, an asteroid on collision course with Earth, the nuclear error, some form of bioterrorism, a suicide epidemic, or the inevitability of the climate crisis. Or perhaps we just never reach a deal on Brexit. <laughs> but there is still hope. When it comes to imagining the end of capitalism, there are still a few thinkers brave enough to stand up and not accept humanity's inevitable end. And one of those thinkers is Douglas Rushkoff. If free market capitalism is our dominant hyperstition or operating system, as Douglas would say, how do we course correct? How do we generate a new hyperstition that allows us to once again influence our collective cultural evolution? And how do we tackle the self-esteem crisis humanity currently faces? Well, this is what the book attempts to answer. And the more time I spend with the book, the more I realize that it's not just an assemblage of pages. It's actually perhaps the first line of defense in ensuring our collective survival. Tonight, 
Douglas will be joined in conversation with the noted Guardian journalist and author, George Monbiot. But before that, please put your hands together and welcome my friend and my mentor, Douglas Rushkoff, to the Virtual Futures stage. Got a little rave going there. That was good. I mean, it's 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 a tremendous honor to be here. I mean, both in the British Library and that hundred zillion people came to to engage with me. Someone like George Monbiot wants to talk to me. Um, you know, I feel like I'm I'm uh, personally at kind of at peak Rushkoff, uh, <laughs> and. It, I wish we were meeting on, on happier circumstances, though. You know, I mean, part of the reason why, uh, why we're here is that there's an urgency to, to have this discussion. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a all hands on deck moment, which is part of why, uh, part of why we're here. So I, I, there's a, there's a, a I, I'm uh, balancing my sense of, of crisis and urgency with my sense of joy and, 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 and honor. But my, my, I am coming committed to bring a message of hope, of, of, genuine, of genuine hope. It's interesting, the, the reviews that I've gotten so far of Team Human, half of them think that the book is fatalistically hopeful that it's you know, Pollyannishly optimistic, and half the reviews think it's a hope, existential despair. You know? And it's interesting to me, and I think the part of the reason that is, is that the, the, the people who see it as hopeless, which is basically like the Wall Street Journal um, and, and other uh, business magazines, that they, they don't even recognize the language, the, the things that I'm saying matter, that are real. In other words, the, the kinds of things that are bringing me hope are things that don't have uh, easy metrics. And so they, it's as if they're invisible. So they'll read it and see, oh, you know, Rushkoff says that about algorithms and this and that and the other. And then I'm talking about human solidarity. And that to them is just, blah, 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 blah. you know, like on Charlie Brown, wah, 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 human solidarity and rapport between people as if that's just some new age fantasy. Now, I, uh, the, the premise of this book, of my work, is that being human is a team sport. That, that it always has been, that we are social beings. And that evolution itself is not what we're taught in school. It is not the story of the survival of the fittest individual in competition with all the others. It's the story of how species have collaborated and coordinated their efforts to survive both, both amongst themselves and with one another. And that's the actual science. Darwin didn't talk about competition. Darwin talked about collaboration. Science shows collaboration. We all know now from a, a great little book, uh, The Secret Life of Trees. You know, I was taught in school that the big tree shades out the little tree, right? They're competing for sunlight and it shades it out then the little one dies. Turns out that's not true. Right, the big tree is actually sharing nutrients with the little tree through a network of mycelia in the soil, which, by the way, turns out to be alive, not just dirt. It's a living matrix. It passes nutrients to the little tree. And then when the big tree loses its leaves in the winter, the little tree, which happens to be an evergreen, then passes its nutrients onto the big tree, and the mycelia take a service fee of nutrients for, for the exchange. <laughs> you know, and human beings, are the same. Human nature is collaborative. To the extent that we are the most advanced species, if we are, it's because we have the most advanced means of collaborating. We are the most social. That's why we develop language and text and all the stuff that we develop. And the internet seemed to many of us to be a, an extension of that social urge. And when the internet first came around, when we first plugged our computers into modems, Forget modems are these things that it was before you, you would go online. But, but when we first connected the computers to each other, a lot of us thought this is what's going to uh, uh, counteract the individuation and isolation 
that has been, been uh, uh, foisted upon us by capitalism, by the myth of libertarian era. You know, and, and uh, uh, silly and psychedelic and new agey, though we were, right, we saw a, a new way of organizing everything, of, of stories would no longer be things with beginnings, middles, and ends, but they'd be more like fantasy role-playing games or infinite games that would go on and, and depend on the creativity of the tellers. We, we thought we were uh, realizing Jim Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis, so we were going to wire together a global brain. Right? The, the digital renaissance, as we used to call it, seemed to be about the possibilities unleashed for new forms of collaboration. What can co the collective human spirit accomplish? You know, and of course, then came the dot-com boom. And we used these technologies to do the opposite. We used these technologies as the salvation for the dying NASDAQ stock exchange. And we looked at digital technology as a, as a way to, well, to grow a market that had reached its limits. It really reached its limits back in the Eisenhower era after, after World War II when colonial powers or colonial uh, or colonies started to push back. But the internet would create new surface area on the market. And so people, instead of being the users of the internet, have become the used. Right? We are not using our smartphones. Our smartphones are using us. Every time you swipe on your smartphone, it gets smarter about you, and you get dumber about it. Right? The landscape, the digital landscape is playing humanity. That's what algorithms do. Algorithms, you know, talk about hyper sigils. Algorithms are the equivalent of demons. We program them to find our human exploits and then leverage them to get us to engage in behaviors that are against our nature and against our own interests. That's like the definition of a demon. The, the digital renaissance was really surrendered to what they called the digital revolution and disruption, but they're not disrupting anything. It was a reactionary movement of the same old powers that be to reinforce capitalism through digital means and to program us really into submission. And the problem with this, the problem with playing people with technology, that every developer is thinking, I'm going to go to Stanford and take B.J. Fogg's courses in captology and learn how to addict people or how to take the, the, the algorithms from Las Vegas slot machines and embed them in social media programs to addict people. And that's not a joke. That's real. They're real books. How to addict people to the net. Here's how the slot machines do it. Here's the algorithm they use. Here's how you put it in your social media feed. I mean, this is real. What happens when you operate that way is you engender a very anti-human approach to the world, where technology is the solution and human beings are the problem to be fixed. At best, human beings are understood in terms of their utility value. We don't have any intrinsic value, any dignity. You don't come in with dignity. You, you have to earn your place. And that's not, that's not social. That's not even human. Right? So we look at human beings and other humans rather than as our source of strength. We look at them as enemies to compete with. And that's when, when, when I, I saw this all too clearly was when I met with these five billionaires who I thought I was doing a talk for, and it turns out they wanted a consult on their, on their fallout shelters, <laughs> right? on, the, on their doomsday bunkers. They were asking me, New Zealand or Alaska, where should we go? How do we maintain control of our security force once our money is worthless? And they're playing this game that that so many of us play and can't help it right now in these conditions, if we don't recognize the landscape, the, the playing field for what it is, they're playing what I've, what I've come to call the insulation equation. Right? How much money do I need to earn in order to insulate myself from the reality that I'm creating by earning my money in this way? <laughs> right? It's like, how fast can I drive to not smell my own exhaust? <laughs> That's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> And the reality is we, you can't outrun it. You can't outrun it because you can't be alone because human beings are social. You can't be alone in your bunker and be a live human. You'll be something else. 
You know, at best you'll be Pharaoh, right? With the hardened heart. You're not alive, right? You'll be the automated, that's these, those folks are the most helpless people I've ever met. They are the most powerless people because they believe the future is something that you predict and prepare for rather than something you create together through your actions in the present. And I get it though. I get it. You know, if you play the doomsday game, the, the, the climate change game, you can say, well, in some of the scenarios, it looks like maybe 10% of the planet will survive. So what's the object of the game? Is be part of that 10%. And that's the calculation as if, well, if there's 10%, then don't waste your time trying to save the world or not earn money or not do all that stuff. You're going to do as everything you can. That's why in America, why do you think we're building walls? It's not to keep out Mexican immigrant workers. It's to prepare us psychically for dehumanization, to block them out. We're not building a wall with Canada. We're going to take their water. So we're building walls rather than, rather than humanizing people, we are putting up boundaries to dehumanize them. And my argument is to do the opposite. Rather than figure out ways to isolate yourself from the masses and all the other people, how do you find the others? And find the others originally was a Timothy Leary psychedelic idea that you'd find the other smart, team, human -y, great, wonderful people. But I'm asking, no, find the others. The real others, if you can't see the human being under the make America great hat, if you can't see the human being in the racist, then how do you expect the racist to see the human being in the Mexican? It actually starts with us. You know, once you find the others and realize that these people are potential friends, right, that's, how we can, uh, uh, that's how we can win this, this struggle, should we call it, this battle, this war. Human beings have the home field advantage on planet Earth. That's where we win, because we have all of our 500,000 years of social mechanisms ready to spring into action and to reinforce uh, our rapport with solidarity and with group action. You know, I, I really do believe we will win this. The human, the human spirit is too powerful. The human soul, dare I say it, the, the human soul is too real. Once you look into the eyes of another person and make that connection, establish that rapport, there's power. And that's more power than any amount of money. That's more power than any nuke. That's more powerful than any government. And I'm actually, uh, although I know these are some rough days ahead, I'm actually looking forward to witnessing humankind rise to this occasion. So with that, let me uh, introduce George Monbiot, one, my mentor and friend. Thanks. I don't know whether to ask you the question first or you ask well, me. You know, uh, you know what I want to do? Yeah. I want to start by honoring those amazing children who today went on climate strike. Because You know, you ended on a hopeful, uh, hopeful note, and honestly, I find more hope in them than I have found in 30 years of campaigning. Mm. I went to one of the um, uh, events today, um, one of the rallies that they had. There were thousands. This was in Oxford. You know, it's not a huge city. Thousands of children came out. Some of them against the wishes of their school, defying the school, who seem to think that attendance figures are rather more important than climate breakdown. Um, <laughs> And they were just amazing. I mean, the, the energy, the dynamism among them, but also the ones who stood up, who were so articulate, they understood the issues, they were right on the science, they were right on the politics. Any one of them could have done a better job than either the prime minister or the leader of the opposition in talking about these things. It was astonishing. And I think, this is what we've been missing all this time, this youth rebellion and this amazing rising. And my feeling is that, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of been trying to foment this kind of, of rebellion and anarchy for a very long time without success. 
And suddenly seeing it happen, uh, partly out of desperation, you know, these were the future generations that we've been talking about for so long who have just been discounted. You know, economic discount rates, they don't count. You know, and oh, oh, wait a minute, they're alive now. And they say they got the same rights as we had when we were, uh, the same rights as we have now. And, and these people, but wait a minute, they, we, we discounted them. They weren't on the spreadsheet because right. they disappeared. The economic discount rate meant that they weren't supposed to exist. Suddenly they spring into existence and say, wait a minute, what have you bastards done to us? <laughs> And to me, this is a tremendously hopeful moment. And I, I do, I think we could be right on the cusp of seeing things turn around. Yeah, I mean, and, and young people, I mean, certainly in America, we've turned the classroom into an extension of work. Yeah. yeah. You know, which is really, which is really kind of insane. And, and the, the only reason I'm, I'm surprised that young people were able to do this is, you know, they, they're being so conditioned from the first day of school uh, that, that, that going to school is about increasing their utility value, and they're going to college to get a job. And it's like, well, wait a minute, job training was supposed to be paid for by corporations, not, you know, the, the education system was, was, was a, a statement, a, 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 an affirmation of human dignity, you know, so the coal miner could read a novel or do something. And the fact that the kids found solidarity, you know, to, to, to do this, and, and, and of course, all the, Theresa May, she put out a statement saying, well, you see, if, if, you know, if they attend school, they'll learn how to be climate advocates. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a bit like that old, old story about the, 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 the rich American who meets a fisherman sitting under the palm tree and, um, and he says, uh, say, say, what are you doing here? He said, oh, well, I'm just, I'm just hanging out a bit. He said, well, why are you hanging out? Well, you know, I've done my fishing for the day. That's all I need to do. But if you fished all day long, you could buy another boat and then hire someone else mm -hmm. to do it. And another one, another one, another one. And the guy says, well, then what would I do? Oh, then you could just kick back, sit under a palm tree, do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, this is exactly what Theresa May is saying. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. And you realize that the lunatics are in charge of the asylum and the inmates are the ones who are desperately trying to take it over and actually put some sense into the right. situation. Right, right. I mean, and the funny is, the, the, the similarly inspiring stories, you know, that Queens, and I was part of this, um, we rejected, Queens, New York rejected the Amazon headquarters. And so many people are still, the, the politicians, I mean, and these are Democrats, and very progressive politicians saying that this is insane, that, you know, we, that, that and first they said it couldn't be stopped, that, that you know, little AOC and, and her little, you know, poor people in Queens or the Bronx, that we're not gonna stop this thing. Then they said we were crazy, and now it happened, and they said, oh, look at this horrible thing that we've done. It's almost like we have to ignore all of the messaging, because we're on the ground seeing, uh, you know, no, we're not going to let what Google did to San Francisco happen to us in Queens. No, yeah. no, exactly. So there is a, kind of an, alter, an alternative reality of hopeful action that we, we have to accept that it doesn't mean we're insane. But isn't it interesting, just like you were saying about the way school children are conditioned, we're constantly told, we don't do this. You can't do this. This isn't the sort of thing that human beings do. You know, we're, right. we, we've, got, we've got these instrumental goals we're supposed to pursue, and it's in your self-interest to pursue these instrumental goals. Whereas what we're all so desperate to do, just as you were saying, is to get together and do things collectively for the good of all of us rather than pursue our self-interest. Right. And how do we get so, uh, 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 so befuddled by this, these total lies that the neoliberals put out that yeah. we're fundamentally selfish I mean, I think and a lot of it, and, and, and the, the beauty of the internet and the, the digital age is we've gotten to see it happen in such a short period of time that it's like watching Koyana Skatsi or something, that yeah. when you see yeah. it all happen yeah. really fast, you can see what the, what the weapons are that they're using. And so you look at, say, Facebook algorithms and look at how they're trying to go to your brain stem and, and they're trying to induce fear, fear of survival, fear, fear. It's not safe. You are not safe. You are not safe. You need walls. You need a place. You need a this. You need retirement money. You're not safe. That I understand. I mean, I just saw Kubrick's uh, 2001. They did the, the re-release of it. And there are all those scenes with the sort of monkey people. And there's this one scene when the little monkey people are sitting like they're at night and they're next to a cliff and they should be sleeping, but their little eyes are all awake. And you hear in the background, there's, there's like the saber toothed tiger or something. And I thought about how many nights did we spend, you know, sitting in fear, you know, and feeling so unsafe. So it's so easy to trigger that you're not safe or that 
being with other people is the dangerous thing. As, and so you, you try to isolate. And we, we bought that. You know, we, we, we fought enclosure, and then we started to seek enclosure. It's true. I mean, there are people all over this country living in, in nice detached houses in the countryside with private keep out signs on the gate who are chronically lonely. Right. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, if anyone comes into their garden, they'll get their shotgun out. I mean, this is, this is the, the ridiculous situation in which we find ourselves. You know, 7.7 billion people on earth and many of us with no one to call a friend because we're told, we're told we, we, we should be an island. We're told, I mean, it's, it, it penetrates the language. You know, you can't, we don't talk about people anymore. We talk about individuals and individuals walking down the street. Who, who the heck decided to call them individuals? When do we consent to this? You can't complete yeah. a sentence without using the word personal. Personally speaking, to distinguish myself from a ventriloquist dummy, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I prefer personal friends to the impersonal variety and personal belongings to those that don't actually belong to me, but that's just my yeah. personal opinion, otherwise known as my opinion. You know, it, we, we just, it's saturated. Right. And then we each and become so, an intersection of one. Well, that's yeah. right. And we, create, and we put the no trespassing signs up around us, don't we? And we become frightened, terrified of social interaction. I mean, yeah. who the fuck are you anyway? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. And then, you know, and, and it's funny, when I, when I talk with groups or communities about sort of, you know, developing sharing, genuine sharing economies or favor banks or the people are very willing, they're willing to do favors for each other, but they're not willing to accept favors. That's the thing, because mm, then they're going to yeah, feel, yeah, oh, yeah, now I'm right. socially obligated. Now, you know, or, you know, and even in, when, I, when I was trying to do the, the, the science research on people collaborating with each other, you know, the, the sort of uh, uh, fake Darwinist uh, uh, social philosophers call it reciprocal altruism. Yeah, 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 As yeah. if it's this calculation that the organism makes about, oh, I will take care of that one's children because that one, if my children are in trouble someday, that one might take care of mine. It's not that you thought that their kid was cute and you didn't want it to get run over by a truck, you know? It's, they're constantly trying to persuade us that we're not yeah. altruistic. They're constantly saying, oh, well, you know, you only did that because you expected something in return. So when I gave that money to the homeless person, I thought that maybe he's going to give me some money back at some right. point. Oh, no, uh, that, no oh. that one is your power. You want to experience your power and your control and the fact that you're not homeless, so you give them money to, to that's create it. Right, that's yeah. right, yes, it, it, it's entirely There's about no it. compassion, don't worry. <laughs> that's right. And, you know, and, and what's so interesting and, and fascinating, so reading your book, um, having done my own research for completely different purposes, an album, bizarrely, in this case, um, we've come to exactly the same conclusions. You know, we, uh, uh, you know, I've read in neuroscience, in social psychology, in anthropology, and evolutionary biology, um, to try and find out what, what makes us tick, what, it, what is it to be human, and we've been saturated in this Hobbesian view that we're engaged in a war of all against all. And of course, neoliberalism is a Hobbesian slash Aristotelian mm -hmm. philosophy. It's a dominant philosophy of our age. And it says that we are fundamentally selfish and greedy, and that's a good thing. We should recruit the selfishness and greed. But all the science shows that while we've got some selfishness and greed in us, the great majority of us, those are not our dominant values. It's altruism, it's empathy, it's fellow feeling, it's community, it's belonging, and the rest of it. Uh, sure. We are a society of altruists governed by psychopaths, mm -hmm. but the psychopaths you know, are, are wildly different to the human norm. Unfortunately, they are in charge, right. which but is a bit of a problem. They're not, but they're not just in charge, but they are uh, uh, manufacturing the landscape mm. in which we live. And at a certain point, if you wake up in a world where everybody hates each other, you think that, oh, well, people hate each other. And then, you know, that's why the internet was so precious to them, because it's it's a virtual world, you know, it's a virtual world where you can, uh, uh, where the rules of nature no longer have to apply. You know, so it, it, you're, you're interacting with these non-player characters out there who, who don't mean you, you know, don't mean you any well, don't mean you, don't mean you, 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 you well. Or even, you know, I talk to people in business and they think that the currency we use is money. They think that's money. They don't think that's a kind of money that was, that was birthed at a very particular moment in history by monarchs who were looking to prevent the rise of the middle class. So they made local currencies illegal and invented an interest-based currency, which then demanded the growth of the economy. No, an economy doesn't have to grow. It doesn't have to grow. Every digital company has to grow because they took money from venture capitalists. These 19 year old kids who drop out of college with a good idea, then transfer parental authority to some Silicon Valley investor in a nice sweater and 
And they, for all of this supposed disruption that they're doing, they're not acknowledging the operating system beneath the technological operating system that they're using. So we do, I mean, the environment we live in doesn't gender certain kinds of attitudes and behaviors. So part of what I'm trying to do is wake people up to say, this is not real, this is social construction. And the way to do that, the only way is to like make eye contact, to hug a person, be with a person in, in real life. Because any other way, particularly these, these Skype types of things, when you try to interact with someone or on a digital, <coughs> these poor kids with digital phones. I mean, do you remember talking to a girlfriend or boyfriend on a real phone when you, I mean, oh, analog, <laughs> twisted pair, baby. Um, but but they, they also engender distrust. You don't realize it's the medium that's not allowing rapport to be established. You blame the other person. So then you get less and less trustworthy. So it's tricky. Well, let, let's not romanticize the analog phone. You, you, you yeah. know the word phony. The word phony actually comes from the telephone. Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's phony because it seems fake. You know, and this, oh, this goes way, way, those, back, so way back, way yeah, back. They seem so natural like, we're, to we're me. All phonies. Yeah. We're all phonies. <laughs> well, that's it. Shifting baseline syndrome, this yeah. tremendously powerful concept is formulated by Daniel Pauly, a fisheries biologist, who says that you know, we conceive as natural and normal what prevailed in our own youth. And then we try to get back to that point right. without realizing that what prevailed in our own youth could be a state of extreme degradation. Now, he was talking ecologically, mm -hmm. but of course it applies right across the board. It's such a powerful concept. He went on to um, uh, come up with the concept of shifting waistline syndrome, where um, a medium-sized sweater today is about three times bigger than a medium-sized sweater 40 years ago. Um, so, uh, and, and we just get used yeah. to, 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 to things, things shifting along. There. But um, what, what I, I, I guess, you know, the question that arises for me when, when I hear you talking about, you know, here is the operating system, here is our need to perceive the operating system. The question is, having perceived it, can we then change it? Do we get traction? I mean, and the reason I'm asking this is, is uh, um, we were talking before about um, the article I wrote last week. Um, was it this? No, this week. Oh, God, I can I never keep track. Um, I write so much bollocks that I can't, can't keep up with it. <laughs> I don't know how anyone else reads it because I don't have time to read it myself. Um, so, um, um, about how these incredible revelations about how the EU referendum was completely um, trashed by cheating, by dark money, by all the rest of it, that Carol Cadwallader and The Guardian and the Open Democracy and Channel 4 News have, have uh, you know, created this enormous scandal by demonstrating what actually happened in the EU referendum. Nothing has changed. We don't have a single new law. We don't even have a single new statutory instrument. Absolutely nothing has been done to reform this totally corrupt system which has been exposed. And when I spoke to the government about it, they were just, oh, well, uh, well uh, blah, oh, sod off. You know, that was basically their approach. It is, it yeah. is scary. I mean, the, I remember all these movies when I was a kid in the you know, 70s and 80s where the movie would end with the person delivering the manila envelope to the New York Times. That now, and you wouldn't even have to see the rest because now it's gonna be exposed. And here, we, it's like every day it's exposed. They're corrupt, they're trying to kill us all. And it's like, oh well, yeah. you know, <laughs> keep, keep going, keep going. I mean, for me, it, it, it's, it's so easy to be disillusioned by these, these system people then, it's funny. I, 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 I waver on this. On a certain level, I feel like it's so imperative that we reconnect on the human ground level that, that I'm less concerned with, oh, how are we going to regulate Facebook? Or how are we going to develop algorithms to change their algorithms? Or worst of all is the you know, humane technology movement, which are the former uh, 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 addiction uh, specialists of Silicon Valley, now they've created an institute to develop more humane technologies, which to me sounds like cage-free chickens, you know? <laughs> You're gonna be humane to them on their way to the slaughter. But the, <laughs> the, the orientation is how technologies are treating us rather than what are we doing with technology. We're still the objects, we're so passive. So uh, uh, while I do believe, you know, and I'm glad there's people, you know, like, like Richard Barbrick say, who's over there, who actually go and yell at these people in government and, do, and, and know how to and work that, luckily not all of us have to do that. Some of us can start to re-socialize 
reality, you know, our local reality, or go to your, go to your school board meeting, go to your uh, land, you know, the, the, the land use meeting. I mean, these only little cr few crazy people show up at those things. You know, we should, we should go there too and start, and start participating. But, but I, I'm, I'm sort of less, I feel like we, in some ways, I'm not, I'm not as concerned with catching up with the technologies and changing all those systems than being aware of them that, that they're fake and then finding the others and connecting with them. It's as if nothing else is a first step, you know, to, to, to rebuild the organism. And the exciting thing is that there's now almost a science of creating participatory culture. I mean, there's, there's, it's, there's been so much fascinating work done looking around the world at what works and what doesn't. And interestingly, possibly the world leading application of that science is here in London, in the London borough of Barking and Dagenham, the most um, <laughs> deprived borough in London, um, where the uh, very far-sighted council has got together with this um, group called Participatory City to apply the lessons from the rest of the world of how to create uh, thick networks, as they call it, vibrant participatory culture where it becomes the norm to be engaged, becomes a norm to find the other. And, and, and becomes a bit odd not to be involved. And so you just sort of flip normality on its head that way. And they've only been running a year. They're already having amazing mm. results. So uh, there, there, there is scope, just as you say, to be highly optimistic about this. And it's also, it's a lot of it has to do with addressing real things rather than ideological ideolo whatever. You know, the, the whole 20th, 20th century was about these competing ideologies. And we put so much, we invested so much in, you know, one or the other, and none of them, are really are, are real, you know. That's that's my problem with Plato, and where I, where I would want to bring back a little bit of Aristotle, you know, that, that Plato helped us see, you know, ideologies up here, and then the real world is down here in this mechanistic Newtonian thing, and 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 Aristotle united them a little bit better, you know. If you look at causes, and the the cause I've been so interested in in these days is the formal cause. What's the formal cause of humans? You know, and that's where you start to get back into soul and into this other stuff that's, that's uh, uh, so much less, uh, it's like you're no longer on the, the, the graph or of, the, of the paper, but in the white part of the paper. You know, you're no longer in national boundaries, but in, in countries, all those artificial, uh, even they're fine in their way, they're useful, but they, they start looking like the fake thing. I, I'm so glad you brought up this platonic substance dualism because I think this is absolutely key to where we've gone so wrong in so many mm. ways, you know, that, that we uh, establish either spiritual or intellectual purity by withdrawing ourselves from the material world. This is a very, very old idea. I mean, it predates Plato, as probably you know from Jeremy yeah. Lent's amazing book, The Patterning Instinct, great yeah. book, by the way. Um, and, 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 and then comes to dominate Christian thought comes to dominate scientific thought, and now dominates technological thought and the ridiculous musings of Ray Kurzweil and people, mm -hmm. people like him, where you know we, the brain is a software, the body is a hardware, we can detach the software from the hardware and we'll live forever, all this total nonsense. But it's that removal from the, the organic living world which, which we have been striving to do to, to achieve purity, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's spiritual purity, intellectual purity, technological purity for so long, which alienates us from each other, from the world around us, and ultimately from ourselves. Right. I mean, and that's part of the problem with the, with the, the psychedelic movement. It's that, you know, you get this urge to, I'm going to rise from the chrysalis of matter into pure consciousness, you know? And it's like, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, well, it's more the, the synthetic psychedelics than the, you know, the ones that kind of drag you down to, that have Mother Earth speaking to you. You know, uh, <laughs> those, those do the opposite. But yeah, the, the, it's that Kurzweilian vision. I mean, that's where originally the, 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 my construct for Team Human came up was I was, you know, in, in, a, in a debate really with him. Um, and I, he was arguing how human beings have to be humble and accept that when the singularity comes that we have to pass the evolutionary torch to technology, right? That, that information has been evolving towards higher states of complexity and went from atoms to molecules to cells to organisms to humans to human culture to computers and on, right? So we should accept our, our, our obsolescence and extinction with grace. 
And I said, no, human <laughs> beings are special. I mean, at the time, I didn't have all the arguments, but I argued we're weird and quirky. We can sustain ambiguity. We can live in liminal spaces. We don't have to resolve everything to a yes or to a no. You know, we can watch a David Lynch movie and not understand what it means and still experience that as pleasurable. You know, <laughs> what, is, what is that, right? So the human beings deserve a place in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're human. <laughs> uh, yes, well, that's your fatal flaw. I always <laughs> suspected it. And that's uh, when I said, yeah, fine, guilty as I'm on team human, you know, fuck you. Um, and th but then, you know, the idea of team, then, you know, I got into to your stuff and, and, and uh, Jeremy Lin's stuff and saw, well, actually, we are a team. That's, that team human is not just against team algorithm, but when we function as a team, we're real. I, I, I was trying to explain uh, Kurzweil's singularity concept to someone the other day who'd never come across it and hadn't really done any of the sort uh -huh. of thing he'd be doing. And she immediately said, it's the apocalypse, isn't it? That's what he's talking about. Well, and right, because they're stuck. I mean, the, these folks, they're still, they were raised as Christian and they have the Christian narrative right. and then they just exactly. impose it on digital and think it's something new. The same way that supposedly digitally disruptive companies are doing traditional British totally. East India trading company style totally. extractive capitalism on a digital platform. Uber does in two years what it takes British East India Company, you know, whatever, 20 years to do in, uh, uh, in its in enslavement routines. But the, the, again though, the beauty of it happening that quickly is white Western people living in a capitalist society, those of us who actually colonized indigenous people, now we're experiencing ourselves as indigenous people. We are the indigenous inhabitants of planet Earth. And we've colonized ourselves with extractive technologies that mean us, uh, that, that are enacting well, what, what the Native Americans called wetico, you know, wetico on us. It's, it's cannibalism on the human species, and of course, on every other species and the, and the rest of the planet. And, and of course, the first people it was done to were the peasants of England. I mean, that's where enclosure began. And of course, as, as you so rightly say, it's continuing by digital and other means today. But the enclosure was first, the great experiment was first carried out on, on, on the English. Well, actually, to be more precise, on the Irish. <laughs> it was done on the Irish, then it was done in the English, then it was done on the Scots, and then we imported it around, exported it around the world. And I spent six years working with indigenous people and saw what happened to them when they lost their land. They lose, they lose their minds. Because everything goes. You don't just lose your land, you lose your community, you lose your identity, you lose your relationships, your connections, everything goes. Everything is severed. It's like in, in, in Philip Pullman's books where they, they remove your demon, your, your mm. diamond from you, and, and, and you no longer, uh, your soul is, is detached um, completely from, fr fr from your body. Then, having come back to Britain, for the first time, I read the poems of John Clare. And, and this, this brilliant self-educated peasant um, who um, <clears throat> starts you know, in his early life describing the wonders of the, the world around him, this, this rich ecosystem and this rich community uh, as well. And then suddenly, um, in mid-adulthood, enclosure comes along, wipes everything out, wipes out all the features on the land, wipes out the community, wipes out the ceremonial life, atomizes people. What happens? He becomes an alcoholic, he loses his mind, he dies in a lunatic asylum. Suddenly I thought, wait a minute, I've just been seeing this. I've just been seeing this exact same process in other parts of the world. And half a set, if it happened to John Clare, it wouldn't happen, happen only to him. It happened to all of us. Every single one of us, our ancestors have been through that exact process of enclosure and total psychic destruction as a result. So where does that leave us? Now, who are we now? Could it explain some of the horrendous social dysfunctions and mental dysfunctions that we suffer from today? Especially as, as you point out, these processes are continuing. And it's interesting to look at when they started enclosure was right after the Crusades when the trade routes had been open and people had opened marketplaces in their, in their towns. We had developed local currencies. We were doing peer-to-peer -peer exchange. The middle class well, the middle class happened. That's when the burghers came the bourgeois, right? Then the, the aristocracy, the lords of feudalism who hadn't worked in 10 centuries needed a way to stop the economy. That's what it was about. So that's why they invented central currency and outlawed all local currencies. That's why they invented the chartered monopoly so that no one could have a small business. And, and that's when they enclosed the commons. So it, it, it's interesting that it wasn't just to be mean, but it was, it, it was actually anti-economic. It was to prevent 
the, the, the velocity of transactions and the growth of an, of an organic bottom-up economy. It's also when the city-state got replaced by the nation-state. Right, so this real sort of organic termite mound of human activity, you know, no, you're not from there, you're from this your artificial boundary. In some parts of England, we have closed parishes where you were not allowed to leave without the express permission of the Lord or to enter. They, they were basically prison colonies, in, mm. in effect, but and huge tracts of England were in closed parishes. We don't, we don't see it in these terms anymore. We just sort of have this sort of romantic view of the past here, but we, we were an enslaved nation. And for the very reason you're talking about, they were trying to say stop. So, so, and that's why, I mean, but it's why, interestingly, you'll see in the digital renaissance, which I think is a renaissance, not a revolution, is a rebirth of old ideas in a new context. In a new renaissance, you'll see the things that got repressed in the last renaissance coming back, being retrieved. This is, McLuhan really talked a lot about retrieval. So you see a lot of medievalism in the digital era, whether it's, you know, piercing and scarification or Burning Man or Etsy or craft beers, you know, a lot of it's, it feels silly, you know, but it's not just style. It's actually these values that if we could retrieve them now, and plus all the values of indigenous cultures that we, you know, that we stamped out in that same renaissance, uh, uh, you know, it's like, you know, it's as if, you know, we stepped way forward with this capitalist foot and we made certain kinds of progress while destroying the planet and killing billions of people. But, <laughs> but, but people say, oh, Russia, you're trying to go back to the middle. No, I'm trying to bring the other leg forward. You know, you can't just go forward on one, one leg all the time. You've got to retrieve the other values. And, you know, so if we can step forward with the other foot, the left foot, um, uh, you know, <laughs> that's for Richard. Um, uh, you, you, you know, we, we could actually make a, a, not progress. Even progress is such a, a, a red herring. You know, progress. You know, I talked about this, and Jeremy talks about this. A lot of us do how we went from sort of a circular understandings of of the world to linear ones. You know, and I'm a Jew, and I love Judaism. It was a great idea. We got text so we could write about the past and write contracts into the future. And oh, Mashiach is coming, and we're going to make progress and go somewhere. But it's part of what led to that pedal to the metal. I'm going to escape my own exhaust mindset too. The sort of ends justifies the means. Whereas if you're in a circular spiritual culture, you understand you're going to see this person again. You know, if not this time, next life or the life after. When it's circular, you can't just, you know, you, it's not about not shitting where you eat because you're going to eat there someday. And, and of course, there's, there's, there's a direct ecological impact to this because we switch from a circular economy to a linear economy. Right. And the, the old organic economy was basically the constant reuse of resources. Um, and there is a pretty well closed loop. I mean, it had some leakage and, and that leakage led to the quest for um, certain linear processes. Right. But now it's almost entirely linear. And there's a, a, a powerful determination by some environmentalists to try to bring back a circular economy, but of course a very different circular economy to, to the one we, we had before. But, but the process basically consists at the moment of digging resources out of a hole on one, one side of the earth, moving them to the other side of the earth, and then dumping them back in a hole. That's the right. economy. That, that's how it works at the moment. Right, but the advocates of that economy will say that we are screwing it up by slowing down the engines of capitalism and progress, we are making it harder for Monsanto to figure out how to grow alfalfa on a rock. You know, that, 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 we've, we've, that, that the only way out is through. And, uh, the know, only way out is through along that road which leads right over the cliff. Yeah. I mean, I mean progress is progress towards the cliff edge. This, this is uh, everything that we were brought up to believe by economists is beneficial and right and good from the ecological perspective is a total disaster. And we're seeing this disaster hitting home now. And you know, what, what do they want? They want 3% growth. 3% growth means a doubling of economic activity every 24 years. And you say, well, well how are we going to accommodate that given that we're already breaching the right. planetary boundaries? And they say, oh, we'll decouple, decouple um, uh, economic activity from material resource use. And you say, well, how well is that going? Well, well, it will happen. And, 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 you know, when you look at the projections done by Jason Hickel and others, you'll see that, you know, a, a more or less sustainable use of resources, about 50 billion tons a year. We can accommodate that within planetary boundaries. We're currently using 70 billion tons of resources a year. Um, uh, business as usual, by 2050, it'll be 180 billion tons. 
with um, maximum efficiency and carbon pricing and some very optimistic assumptions, you might be able to bring it down to 95 billion tons at current rates of growth, more likely because of the rebound effect, 130 billion. So more or less twice what we have today. Right. And that's the maximum decoupling, which then quickly reaches its physical limits, the Carnot right. efficiency. But you, of the rest that of it. 3% growth, I mean, is baked into a central currency uh, driven uh, economic operating system. It's, it's, you have to. That, cause it, and the funny thing is, it's a few monarchs in the 12th century come up with something that now is the basis of what of, we, we assume it's, it's, it's <coughs> just the, the operating system of nature. But so many of us are invested in it ourselves. We don't have communities, so we're depending on our retirement plans to be the way that we survive in our old age. And what's your retirement plan going to do if the government doesn't somehow get that 3% growth? So you personally, your retirement, your future is at stake. You're going to lose if we win. You know, so what do we do? Again, so then, well, maybe we should, you know, it was so funny. I went to, uh, to Rome when I was in college. And the thing that was so weird to me about Rome is you walk around at night and everybody's out. And all these different generations are there at the same time, like old people, like old ladies are sitting there and teenagers are kissing and kids are playing and... I was like, oh, I get it. It's like, you don't have to, I mean, because I was young, you don't have to send old people to these weird <laughs> homes, you know? <laughs> you know, the whole idea is, okay, I'm going to earn enough money in my working years so I can live off this bag of money for the rest of my life. It's like, what creature does that? It's like a squirrel, like a squirrel when it's six years old and it knows, oh, I've only got a year left. I'm going to save up a whole lot of nuts now, <laughs> you know, so I can just live off them the rest of my life. It's like, what, what is the idea that these people are not as humans, that they're not valuable, that they're because they don't have economic output, that they're not um, uh, uh, creating so much value for their communities, even if it's just being in charge of the remote control, you know, of the TV, it's a service. You know? Shall we open this up? Oh, please, yeah. Um, what I thought we would do, as I always try to do, is to go woman, man, woman, man. Um, if you identify as non-binary, you can raise your hand at any time. But otherwise, um, you know, if we don't do it that way, we know what happens, don't we, don't we gentlemen? <laughs> so um, so um, is, is there a woman to start us off with a penetrating question? Yes, there seems to be one there. Thank you. Um, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Uh, so the first thing, my fa uh, favorite book about dualism is um, Margaret Wertheim's Pythagoras' Trousers, partly because it's such a great title. The second thing is that a um, very good example of what you're talking about, altruism, is the Guardian, its own online, uh, online uh, edition, because... Most online entirely run by altruists. Most no, most online newspapers. That, right, they charge to be behind a paywall. Right, they charge you to get news before anybody else. And the Guardian said, "We will charge you so that other people can get news." And as a result, they have a hundred million readers around the world, and um, you know it pays its own way. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the thing I really wanted to ask was, one of the things that interests me is that we have been used to thinking of or being told that algorithms and computers are incredibly clever. But actually, anybody who's ever encountered Alexa or a voicemail system knows that the opposite is the case. And you look at the ImageNet database, take 61,000 pictures of cats to teach a computer to recognize a cat. A toddler can generalize a cat in about two instances. And from generalizing, we can generalize things like Newton's law. So one of the things that I think is really important to do is actually to start persuading people that the problem with AI is not that it's very clever, but that it's incredibly stupid. And it wants to make us stupid too. Um, so, you know, I wonder what, what you had to, to say about yeah, that and how I, you go about it. I think it. about that one a lot. You know, people talk about the day that computers will pass the Turing test, you know, that they're going to be, that, that will be it, it, uh, indistinguishable from, from humans. You know, if, com if computers pass the Turing test, it's not because they've gotten smart, but because we've gotten dumb. <laughs> right, because we 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 can no because we would no longer be able to tell the difference. The the only people who say that we know what human consciousness is are computer scientists. You talk to any neuroscientist, and they're like, 
<laughs> really, they are. And, and you know, when you start looking at the, at the real structure and function of, of the brain, how complex it is, you realize all the supercomputers in the world are still not as complicated as one little human brain, you know, because of all the little points of contact and the way, the way it works. But <coughs> algorithms are really good at one thing, detouring around the frontal lobe, around the whole neocortex, and getting right to the brainstem. You know, and the brainstem, that yes or no, fight or flight, you know, it's, it's so easy for them to trigger that, which is why what I'm telling people to do now is to, is to remember that every technology, every medium you use is a drug. It's a drug. And, it, and, and Timothy Leary used to say that, that the, the internet is, is as powerful as LSD. It's basically LSD. So if the internet is LSD, we have an entire Western world now living in a psychedelic substrate with no awareness of set and setting, and everybody's having a bad trip. <laughs> right? But if you accept that everything that you're using is a drug, I am on Facebook. I am on Twitter. You know, think. You think for a minute before you go on that drug. You know, again, Leary used to say, before you take a drug, look into the eyes of someone who's on that drug and decide if that's somewhere you want to be. <laughs> you know, and, and you think about, you go to, a, go to a monastery and you'll see monks there you know, on uh, vows of silence. They're not on a vow of silence because of ego. It's like, oh, I've heard myself talk too much. No, it's because they are acknowledging that language itself is an operating system with biases. It's a drug, your mind on English, your mind on Spanish. There, it's, it's a way, now there's subjects and predicates and objects and verbs, there's nouns, Every, everything now has become a noun and it becomes enclosed. They want to experience what is reality like off that drug. So that's, you know, when you realize that, it's like, yeah, they're not that powerful, I'm just drugged. Right? They're not, they're, they're, I'm in a very simple, uh, 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 simply constructed mind control platform. You know, and yeah, I've read the stuff that B.J. Fogg and the, the captologists and the, the uh, uh, addiction specialists of the internet that they use, and they're very, very simple feedback mechanisms. You know, there are four lines of code that can work to, as long as you make someone afraid, or, it's like sh putting a red cape in front of a bull. The red cape's not that smart. Right? The bull is smarter than the cape, right? but it'll still charge it. Thank you. Great answer. Um, so a man with a question. I'm going to dart around a bit. Um, yes, sir, with the cap. Hi, I'm Alex Holland, and I'm starting a publishing house which is going to inspire the radical social change that we need by telling stories of love, loss, and conflict set in worlds where shit has gone right. So, for example, the detective story set in a world of a 21 hour working week. She's only got so much time to solve the case, clock is ticking down, before she's got to go to an invigorating talk with two leading humanists. And the other key element is technology is the servant and not the savior in these societies, and it's called the utopists. And both of you have been big inspirations for this, and uh, lots of source material from Team Human about what this good future might look like. Uh, your latest book, it looks brilliant. I've got to confess, I haven't read it yet. It's on the list. But, <laughs> but one of the examples, my question is to you, which is that in what I've seen in your summaries of the book online is that uh, the restoration narrative, there's multiple different narratives out there, but politically is one of the key stories to tell. And we need to pose alternative stories to the failures of the current system. And we need to give people an idea of a world in which they can buy into to motivate them to make that change. And you've said restoration narrative is the main one. Why is that, if you could say briefly? Thank you. Um, well, um, so I'll just explain briefly what the restoration narrative is. I mean, there's, as you know, a lot of dispute about how many basic plots there are. There's either three or five or seven or nine. It's never an even number. There's always, always a number of basic plots. And one of them, and a very powerful one, is what I call the restoration narrative, which goes like this. The, the land has been thrown into disorder by powerful and nefarious forces working against the interests of humankind. But the hero or heroes of the story confronts these powerful and nefarious forces against the odds, overthrows them and restores order to the land. It's the Bible story. 
it's the Lord of the Rings story, it's a Narnia story, it's a Harry Potter story. It's a very familiar narrative structure, but it also turns out to be a common element in just about every successful political or religious transformation there's ever been. Um, and uh, people with wildly different views and objectives will plug those views and objectives into that story structure and use it to great effect because when we um, try to make sense of the world, the sense that we try to make is not the sense that a philosopher or a mathematician or a scientist might recognize, it's narrative sense. Narrative is the heuristic, the shortcut that we use to try to cut through the incredible noise of data with which we're, we're surrounded. You know, we, just one human brain is phenomenally complex. Our brains in conjunction with everybody else's, because that's how our minds are formed, is more complex still. The, the ecosystem is phenomenally complex. Everything we've ever encountered in our lives is phenomenally complex. So if we try to make mathematical sense of it and say, well, this data stream is telling me that, and this data stream is telling me the other, so what do I um, conclude from this, these co conflicting sources of data? we'd not do anything at all. We'd be completely paralyzed with indecision all day long. So we're looking for shortcuts. And the shortcut we look for is what has become the story, the narrative. And some of these narrative structures go back tens of thousands of years, possibly hundreds of thousands of years, because they make that sense of the world. They tell us who we are, how we got here, where we're going. That's basically what we're looking for in, in these stories. And a political story that resonates is one that tells you that, but that resonates particularly is one that tells you that using the restoration narrative structure. And you know, why are we stuck with neoliberalism? Neoliberalism, which incidentally told a very powerful restoration narrative, just as Keynesianism told. Um, well, uh, fundamentally, the reason is that when neoliberalism crashed and burnt in 2008 and was exposed as morally, intellectually, politically, and socially bankrupt, what did we do? We came forward and said, uh, well, instead, perhaps, um, I don't know, uh, maybe a little bit less neoliberalism or maybe go back to social democracy or something, or uh, Keynes, uh, you know, he had some ideas. We had no new story with which to replace it. And as a result, we're stuck with neoliberalism, with even more extreme forms of neoliberalism than we had before 2008. It's absolutely fundamental to tell a coherent story which uh, explains the transition from one dispensation that we live with at the moment and that we hate towards the dispensation that we want to reach. And it's our failure to tell stories. It's our failure to tap into that narrative instinct which traps us in the dysfunctional situation in which we find ourselves now. But to some extent, we tried to tell those stories. You know, did, did, I was trying to tell that story. You know, I wrote this book, Life Inc., talking about you know what happened and how we were had, had this peer-to-peer -peer economy and it was disrupted by neoliberalism and, and and trying to get you know the the Obama administration to do something other than bail out Goldman Sachs, which is say just distribute a PDF showing communities how to do local currencies and that would be better you know, for everyone then this, yeah. this whole thing. Um, it, it's like that they didn't believe our stories. And is it because we didn't tell the stories well enough or because they just don't believe the, the story? Mm. Well, yes, of course, it's always a question of whether it gets traction. But in that, if you're trying to appeal to people who are already invested in the old story, you know, that, 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 that's gonna be a much tougher ask than appealing to people who are alienated from the old story but don't right. know where to go. You know, I'm constantly told everywhere I go, people say, oh, you're preaching to the choir. As if that's a bad thing. You know, you preach to the choir because the choir are the people who are closest to you. Yeah, at least closest I'll to where the lecture you know? is. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and what you do, you know, the way politics works is through preaching to the choir. You, you, mm. you, you, you imbue people with the equipment they need to move on from right. the dysfunctional state in which we are. And then you create a circle of interest, a circle of people who are committed to a new set of ideas and, and a new set of tools with which we can, can, can move forward, who then expand that circle. They reach the next circle out, who reaches the next circle out. Big organizing does this in a very systemic and interesting way. That's what got Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in, into Congress and many other inspiring people as well. It systematizes that, that, that ever widening circle approach. But you have to start with the people 
are closest to you and, and reaching those people who are already committed to that other system is much, much tougher. We get them eventually, but only when, you know, when they've tried everything else first. You know, as Churchill said, you know, the, the, the Americans will do the right thing in the end, but only having tried everything else first. And unfortunately, that applies to all of us. Um, is there a woman in this sector of the audience with a question? There is, down here. Thank you. Um, wait for the microphone. Oh, uh, oh, oh, all right. Well, we'll come to you next woman then. Go, go on then. Hi, um, I'm only in the second term of my PhD, so excuse me if you think I'm absolutely talking out my ass. But um, I've read quite a lot of Kurzweil and um, I noticed he brought up his kind of theory of mind uploading and the brain as a software to substrate independent minds. And um, I wanted to kind of get your perspective on what's my take on it, which is... Um, if we could be uploaded, my theory is that we, it would facilitate collaboration because if we no longer had organic needs, um, it would be more difficult for the powers to be to kind of engineer the scarcity of resources and manipulate our self-esteem. Um, so it would kind of be easier for us to cast those, those kind of competition urges aside and actually collaborate. What's your kind of take on that? <laughs> well, I mean, my take is the, the operative word is the if. You know, if, if we could bring a shaman in here who could help us all move into a shared, you know, uh, extra corporeal consciousness, you know, then yay. I mean, I'll play, you know. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 it's, it's, I mean, I, I, I don't want to label it. It's just that it's like, it's, it's science fiction. It's really cool as a thought experiment. And I love the idea of saying, let's imagine second life kind of virtual connected scenarios as a thought experiment to inform the way that we interact as people, you know, and that's, that's fine. But, you know, the, 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 the time it takes to think about all that is time I could be spending actually averting uh, crisis. You know, I just it doesn't it just doesn't seem to me to be a, an, an efficient approach, and it it negates just how complex um, how complex uh, 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 human experience is. You know, uh, mind. It turns out mind is not entirely a brain phenomenon anyway. We're learning that our connective tissue. Not even the organs, the connective tissue has so much, uh, uh, so many of our, our sensibilities and, and experiences are in there that um, uh, I think that there's a more fruitful uh, conversation and exploration to be had. Uh, you know, gosh, going to a yoga class, you know, and, and not because to make you stronger or better workers, right? Not, to, not for, for, for that, but, but for, for the, the experience or learning to sit. Um, you 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 go you go to more interesting places, you know. Uh, man in this sector, yes, in the black shirt. Keep your hand up. Hi, I'd like to ask a question about politics. Um, something that strikes me in this country and many others is how many eminent people say the only way we can deal with the challenges of the twenty first century. AI and bioweapons and climate breakdown is we need benign dictators, people like the astronomer royals, Martin Rees, James Lovelock, you mentioned Gaia theory, think that you know our political systems are so short-termist and so fundamentally flawed that we need an enlightened despot to sort it all out for us. And what struck me about when you were talking was you were saying, okay, when I was listening to what you were saying politically, you said, well, let's go to the town meetings and let's get our voices heard. But that's not dealing with a fundamental flaw of representative democracy, which is that it disenfranchises future generations, future people. That's why my 10-year-old daughter was on climate strike today. Um, so what kind of political system should Team Human be aspiring to create? Um, well, I guess I, uh, economically, I'm an anarcho-syndicalist, you know. So, and and the the that just means lots of cottage industries that are sort of networked together. Um, and the the political system that would be consonant with that would be uh, extreme local government, you know. And the more that the more we are 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 facilitating 
our, our communities with local government, the less we're depending on, you know, Trump or somebody. I mean, what the hell is he supposed to do from the White House for me? You know, and uh, I, think, I think it's fine to have ways that our local governments, you know, coordinate their activities and model, uh, model each other's uh, 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 approaches or you know, uh, to have larger, larger government units to secure kind of universal human rights across you know, l large territories so you don't end up with some little feudal lord in Memphis or something. But um, I don't know why I picked Memphis. But, um, maybe. but how, does this, how does this address the question of, of intergenerational equity? Because, because that's the thrust of the question, isn't right. it? How, how do you avoid, you know, whether you're operating at a local level or operating at a national or international level, how do you avoid us eating other people's futures? Oh, we shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, my, my sense of it is as people feel uh, more connected and more like they're participating in a real world, the less likely they would be to act that way, to, you know, it's, a, it's a, a local business doesn't mortgage itself, it doesn't mortgage the future because a, a, a family owned business, they're thinking not how much money can I extract from this community in order to give my kid money when I die, they're thinking how can I make a business that's strong enough and resilient enough so my kid can be in this business later, you know, and, and but what if we were to take a step beyond business and say, rather than looking at either state or market, we looked, for instance, at the commons. Hmm. Now, the commons is very right. interesting from the intergenerational perspective because, I mean, the hmm. commons can be defined as a resource, a particular community that manages and controls that resource, and the rules and negotiations they create. Right, the and key... it will only work, really, most things, most commons are going to be local. That's right. And, and exactly, right. local. And and they are inalienable. This is crucial. They can't be sold. They can't be given away. And either the, the, the resource or the product of the resource is divided equally, or shared equally amongst all its members. And so there's, there is a sort of long-term objective is to sustain the resource and so, so that it keeps supporting the, the community from it. And maybe part of where we are trapped in our thinking is that we're constantly told that you know, left-right politics is a tension between state and market which it is, but is also household and commons. And these two other sectors of the economy, which we right. massively <laughs> neglect in our political and economic discussions. And, and you know, one of my objectives is to bring the household and the commons to the fore and start talking about these as the incredibly important economic sectors that they are, and which might help to get us to, to start engaging and resolving some of these uh, crucial intergenerational right. question. And you start looking at the purpose of government is very different. It's not about regulating businesses. Mm. You know, it's about managing managing the commons. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. Um, I promised you a question. This uh, woman in the second row here. Uh, microphone coming your way. Right. Hi, thank you, Douglas, uh, for your book. I'm halfway through, but I haven't finished it. You say that it's very hopeful. And you talk about um, how we are using our algorithms to go bypass our frontal cortex. But that's a choice. So when we build our um, mechanisms, we can build them for a reason. So there's a reason why we do that. And that is because the user is not the customer of that tool. And so when we talk about it being hopeful, I think there are companies and algorithms out there that we use that knowledge that we have of our brain in a in a constructive way. So keep making sure that the user and the customer is aligned. And there are good examples of those companies. And so um, as we walk around and, and want to take that hopeful progress forward, have you come across, and maybe it's later in your book and I haven't seen it yet, but in terms of good examples. So, for example, Slack, everybody's thinking it's a great company, might go IPO this year. Um, but, you know, is there a better version? Is there a company coming behind Slack that is actually using algorithms in a way where beautiful that we're democratizing um, power play in in societies and in and so it's done a lot of service but 
it has issues thanks to its algorithms. Um, there are some good companies at the back that are using could, the knowledge could, we could have we in a good way. Get, get to the question. So good examples from you on where people are using algorithms in a positive way. I mean, almost no commercial ones. I mean, because part of the problem is they're running on an operating system where they have to grow. So even something like Facebook, as, as chauvinist and silly and adolescent as it was to start, it was a pro-social platform until they had to show growth. And then it wasn't allowed to be. Then it needed to become extractive. Twitter, I thought, was terrific. It was terrific right up to the point when they were earning about $2 billion a year, you know, which seemed to be enough for a 140-character messaging app, $2 billion. <laughs> but Wall Street called it an abject failure. And that's when they had to start you know, using algorithms and finding ways to become uh, more extractive. Slack started out great. I don't know if it's bad or not now. I mean, WordPress. Was, is, is a fun one, and they're, I guess they're a nonprofit, right? So they're, um, they work, Mozilla is a nonprofit, they work, Lumio and all the Inspiro companies are great, but the reason why they're great is because they don't have to go evil, right? They don't have to, in, in the quest to grow, they don't have to turn their customers into a resource to extract you know, uh, heinous value from. But yeah, it's just so hard. Once you sell your company to the mob, you've sold your company to the mob, and it's going to become the face of a stock scam. Not, a, 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 it's not going to serve customers anymore. Man with a question. Um, uh, yes, sir. In the T-shirt, keep your hand up. There you go. Um, Richard Knight, Imperial College. Um, a question. So we're talking about transitions, and often transitions depend on the powers that be. Um, businesses are one of the big power holders at the moment. I was wondering what kind of role you see those uh, businesses having in a transition to a sustainable uh, society. So which businesses or any of them? <sighs> the most powerful. I, I suppose any, but... Um, I mean, really... Um... I feel like Malcolm X talking about whether white people can help, can help, you know, what can a white person do? Nothing, just get out of the fucking way. Um, <laughs> seriously, there, there's, uh, I would say there's really almost nothing they can do except break themselves up. You know, I went, I went to a, uh, a shareholders meeting, I was, I was gonna get to do a talk for a shareholders meeting of a Fortune 100 company. And these folks, it's one of the biggest companies in the world, you know, top 20 company, and the shareholders and management were there and they were chanting 4.3, 4.3, which was their growth target for that year. <laughs> and I got up there and I said, you're one of the biggest fucking companies on the whole history of the planet. And if you have to grow for it to be okay, do you see any problem with this? That you, there's no sustainable outcome. You have to eat everything. It's nuts. So, so no, I mean, people ask me, you know, what should Mark Zuckerberg do other than give back 90% of the money he took because he took too much? Give back the comp, break up the company. Just break it up. Give the 90% to the shareholders if you have to, if they complain or die they sue you or whatever. Die would be constructive as well. What? Die would also be constructive. Yeah, no, he doesn't have to die. He doesn't have to. He's still a human in there. There's no, still I know, a human. I know, I know, I know. There's a I... lonely child. Didn't you That's see the true. movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right? The vision of Aaron Sorkin's vision of the world. Um, but you know, if only there was a West Wing. Um, but no, I think, you know, they should die. They, as, as corporation, they should break themselves up. They should, they, they, they should turn on their shareholders. They should not continue to buy into the fiction that they're going to get sued by their shareholders if they become socially responsible. That's a myth. That's a myth. You're allowed to be a good company. They're not, they're not going to sue you. They might sell your stock, you know, but fine, you know, then deflate. But this isn't going to happen spontaneously. I mean, they had to be regulated out of their current existence. They have right. to be regulated until they're brought down to the human scale. And, you know, they're not going to regulate themselves. We know that. Philanthropy isn't going to save the planet. It never right. did. Philanthropy is just the rich guy's way of making themselves feel better. 
we've got to tax yeah. them, we've got to regulate them, we've got to constrain them. And the whole purpose of neoliberalism, the current dominant ideology, is to allow the ultra-rich to escape the constraints of democracy. We have to push back against that and subject the ultra-rich to the constraints of democracy. That's the key yeah. to us. So, um, uh, where are we? Yes, a woman with a question. Yes, uh, the one in the black there. Sorry, I keep uh, heading towards certain directions. I'll try to broaden my vision. But um, go on. Hi, I'm from a regulator. So you've put your finger exactly where I wanted to ask. Um, previously, you were talking about... Um, you were talking about after 2008, there was no new narrative and as a result, nothing changed. Actually, what didn't change was the law. So it's still necessary, however much it might be the case that, it's, that uh, corporations have the discretion not to maximize shareholder value, it's still an obligation for publicly listed companies to demonstrate that they have maximized shareholder value. That hasn't changed, that didn't change after 2008. And while I love the idea that you know, Mark Zuckerberg should wake up one morning and have this sort of you know, <laughs> wonderful image in his mind that he should break up his company rather than as he's proposing to do uh, monopolize it even more and combine his data, um, I just don't think it's going to happen. So my question is, while I hope that we have lots of cottage industries and lots of local participation and that people read this manifesto and in their local areas they pursue it, um, in the meantime, uh, what do we do about Facebook, for instance? What kind of regulation uh, do we think about imposing on companies like Facebook, companies that control our data? Where do we change the law? I mean, I'm, I don't want to sound nihilistic. In America, I look at our, our political will, and it's just so, I mean, it's so sick. It's so sick. The whole conversation is about funding a wall now. Um, you know, and when I see, do see a little bit of, of a congressional oversight and they're asking, how does Facebook get on my email or something, you know, I mean, that they've, they've got so little knowledge. That that's why, I mean, I've, I've tended to focus my efforts on just, just get off Facebook. Let's just leave. It's so easy. They, they, they don't just leave. I mean, then I say I want to leave and people say, oh, well, that's an elitist argument because now other people have to be on it and you don't. And. Oh, um, so it's 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 hard, but no, I mean, I would you regulate the, the the heck out of them. I mean, how what? Um, they have to. They can't have any black boxes around their algorithms. They've got to show everything everything they're doing. Um, they they. I mean, if if we if we regulated them the way I would want to regulate, and they would become a you're now a public utility. You're you're too you're too big. You know, but, but, you know, good luck with that. You know, it's like more like children will have to die or something for the U.S. government to regulate them like a, a utility when they don't even understand what it is. I mean, America is a place where when municipalities try to create Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi, the companies, the, 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 the companies like Verizon sue the municipalities on the grounds that the municipality has an unfair advantage because they're located in the place where the Wi-Fi is going to be offered. You know, so it's like when, when I see things like that, I mean, it, I, don't, I don't mean to sound cynical, but it makes me like, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, regulation is not my expertise. These all look like monopolies to me. They all look like, so, so I thought we break up monopolies, but we're not. So, um, I, I feel like uh, our, our, our power as individual or as, as groups of consumers to use or not use is, is, is in their system is, is the easiest high leverage point that we have. Uh, time for one very quick question uh, from a man uh, over there. Yep, with the scarf. Um, yep, keep your hand up. That's it. There we go. Hi. Very quick. Yep, I'll be quick. Um, Douglas, uh, climate strike. I'd like to hear some more thinking about that. A um, couple of reactions of the mainstream media. They were accusing the young people of bunking off, as you call it in the South School. We call it slamming in Yorkshire, but basically stepping out of school because they just wanted a day off. 
Um, B the BBC was particularly bad at that today. And also Theresa May's irony vacuum of saying that they were wasting time. So from a media, yeah, that's what she said. Did you not know that? Right, so what, what I'd like really quickly is, what do you think is gonna happen next with that movement? And I hope it is a movement, but how do you think they're gonna stop it? I wonder, I wonder. I mean, there's, there's maybe they will leverage even that sentiment that they've slacked off. You know, what if we slacked off? What if we decided that life was about leisure, not work? You know, and realized that even the idea of getting jobs for people is inane. Jobs were invented in the Renaissance once we were not allowed to have our own businesses. And why are we getting jobs for people anyway? Because we need more stuff? No, it's so that we can justify letting people have the stuff. So we get the government to give money to a bank, to lend money to a corporation, to build a factory so they can give jobs to people making plastic doodads that nobody needs and they buy and they throw out and it goes in the ocean and destroys fish or something. You know, why do we do that? Because the person needs a job. That's ass backwards. So, so maybe they will realize that. What the fuck are we doing here? What are we learning? Why are you trained for? I don't need a job. I don't want your stinking job. I mean, so, you know, maybe uh, uh, that might be the next, the, you know, the next phase. Because you can learn. You can still learn without, you know, being trained for, you know, the principals of the schools, they're meeting with CEOs now. What do you want the children to know? Excel, Java, what, what, what do you want? They just externalize the cost of corporate job training onto the public sector. You know, so, so, you know, let them wake up to that. Yeah, why is school so unfun? Right? It's because it's work. Which is a lovely way, way to end. Thank you very much, Douglas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.